um, just to um, kind of start the conversation, uh, I want to, to ask um, all of you um, one question, and maybe we can go um, from one person to the other and, and see if you, if you can engage with this question. So the question that I wanted to ask you is what do you think um, you can learn from the other disciplines that participate in, in this conversation, if anything? Um, yeah, who wants to go first? So, so in, in terms of just what, what the cross-cultural fertilizer? No, 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 like the course discipline yeah. fertilizer. So what you, what, is there anything you could possibly um, kind of learn or, or, or integrate into your, um, your work from, yeah. from the different disciplines? Perhaps I, I could start. I, I mean, I think the idea of um, sort of context... almost swallowing it now um, the um, I, I think um, the, the idea of sort of uh, change, changing context for the same sounds uh, which which you've illustrated so beautifully this afternoon is, is a really powerful tool that, that, that we can we can use in imaging in, 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 in a number of different experiments and I think um, that that's a clear example where we've sort of taken the behavior and and, 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 and use that just to look at what might be the sort of generative properties that go beyond the simple sound structure. So, so I, I, I think that's the first immediate example that occurs to me. I guess um, we were talking about this profusely at lunch <laughs> and planning pro future projects, but um, uh, I, I think one of the first elements is um, in the design of a project, how to incorporate both, let's say, indigenous um, notions of nature and culture and scientific, let's say, Western science notions of nature and culture. And that's something that indigenous, uh, the research group that we're involved with in Colombia is really interested in doing. So um, the question then becomes, how do we forge questions like how, um, around very different understandings and data production of what counts as nature and what counts as culture and data production. And how do we need to then create types of questions and languages in which these three possibilities could feed back into each other. And um, I think it's a really rich moment uh, for um, engaging with that type of work. And um, I have, n that's why I basically said, you know, what is required here for us to begin to ask questions in ways that would allow these approximations to happen? And I think um, that's one of the things we were talking about uh, earlier, and that's certainly been the experience in conversations with Nori is, um, what does this imply in the modes of posing questions um, about data, about science, about evidence, about modes of conceiving who listens and how is how does listening happen in, in in comparative perspectives as well as how the environment itself or how n notions of nature are conceived across different um, um, types of understanding let's say so in music cognition there's lots of examples across the case uh, the course of the history of, of the field where kind of intuitions people had about how music worked constrained what kinds of variables they operationalized so what what are you going to you know study what kind of tasks do you have and how, how does that um, how do these tasks serve as appropriate approximations for this large scale thing you might care about like emotional response or memory or something and and there's just these kind of um, uh, ways of thinking about that that have emerged over the past couple of decades um, that that uh, could could do with some um, uh, reconceptualizing right at the forefront where, where you think about uh, you know what emotional response to music is and and how how musical uh, memory works within a within a culture uh, that you know you really can't um, solve without involving um, people who think really deeply in a humanistic way about how music functions within the culture. So um, uh, that's, that's a part that's really exciting to me. So um, perhaps maybe you want, want to ask each other 
uh, a question, and 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 so I just raised it as a top opportunity to you know. Um, so if you if you're interested in doing that, um, ask each other a question. Um, I, I had a question about the repeated sequences actually, and, and the sort of uh, nice development of that from the Diana Deutsch um, uh, original demonstration. Um, the, the the timing jitter I thought was really interesting. The way that into uh, to to what extent does the um, the way in which the phrases obey musical rules uh, affect the extent to which you hear me. So in other words, if you have like a um, spoken sentence equivalent of finishing on a tonic or a fifth and those kind of things, mm -hmm. have, have you looked at that? Yeah, so I haven't um, personally looked very much at what the features are of the utterances that are enabling some to transform and preventing others from transforming. I think that's the area you're asking about. Yeah. However, there are other groups that have been doing that. And what, I mean, sort of the takeaway point from that work, as I understand it, um, is that it really doesn't seem to be in very low level features that are easy to extract at, at a very fundamental level. Mm -hmm. It seems to be at um, one level higher at something about how, um, well, the kind of prosody fits some kind of regular musical pattern that's typical mm. within the culture and so forth. So, so it's um, something at a higher level rather than something like fundamental pitch stability or, you know, yeah, yeah. something like that. Um. So I guess I, I would have a question, which is um, one of the areas of sound studies that has developed a, a lot is how um, technologies, the design of technology has been influenced by especially communicative technologies, telephone, so Mara Mills work for example, by auditory um, uh, processes of mishearing or you know ch changing the sound wave according to to certain uh, perceptions of auditory damage. So my question would be um, I'm very interested in possible conversations between these histories of sound technologies, disability, and how they get inscribed into modes of working technologies. And I wonder if imaging technologies and sound perception technologies and um, in medical research um, incorporate also these sort of technological or aesthetic histories of sound and vision yeah. and how they do so. Yeah. So, so I think... Um we, we, we're just starting to. Um, sorry, I should get close to the microphone. Um, there's quite a lot of work on um, using imaging techniques to look at uh, how hearing aids can uh, uh, benefit people, uh, and we're doing some studies on subjects with cochlear implants as well. Um, the, the, there's a technical glitch. Uh, which is that um, it's not a great idea to put people in a powerful magnet if they've got a co cochlear implant in their, um, uh, within their brain uh, or, or, or actually to use a, um, um, uh, or, 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 or actually to use um, a hearing aid within, within a magnet. Um, and, and it's been kind of fun actually. We've been doing some work recently um, where we've been going back to old school PET positron emission uh, tomography, uh, where we're using a radioactive tracer to look at blood flow within the brain uh, in subjects who have um, uh, co either cochlear implants or, or, or hearing aids, um, where it, it, it's um, a less powerful uh, technique uh, than fMRI, but you can actually get down to single subject inference if you keep the, the experiments uh, simple enough. So it is a way, I think, where you can look at um, you know, adaptation to these advi these devices, possibly look at cross-cultural mm -hmm. uh, effects as well, uh, and, and, and where you can look at um, the sort of development of the adaptation uh, to the devices. So I've, I've maybe what's probably a very basic question <laughs> about your research. So you're talking about um, misophonia, and the reason that it uh, qualifies as a disorder is because it's this very stable pattern of kind of descriptions that people have. And I was wondering, are there ever examples where there's some stable pattern among some group of people, but you might not want to call it a disorder? Or maybe you would, I'm thinking, let's take people who love Wagner. So let's take <laughs> ring heads. And there might be really stable reports from person to person yeah. about, right, what they, like, what Wagner does. Is it. Um, but you might not want to call it a disorder. And uh, <laughs> so is there, is there room for, for something that's not a dis or what's, where's the line there? I, I, I suppose just to 
take issue with you slightly. Um, <laughs> y your argument would invalidate the whole of the Diagnostic and Statistical <laughs> Manual. <laughs> uh, um, and, 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 and I suppose the bottom line is whether the, um, uh, the sort of combination of features which you're defining are out with what should be um, experienced in a so-called normal uh, population. But, but yeah, it's, it, 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 it's a valid uh, perspective. And, and, and that was really one of the motivation to, to want to look at the brain as well uh, within these subjects, yeah. I, I want to end up with the uh, with last, last one question for all three of you. So I, I think when, when you came through the presentation, it was a lot of cases where uh, the results were really surprising about consistencies and inconsistencies consistencies across individuals. And it's kind of quite cutting a line that we will not necessarily predict. So, I mean, your results about uh, verbal description is that really, you would not expect that consistency, but I actually consistent. And then your uh, colonial archive is, is providing an example where, you know, the, the sound was physically there, but the response was so different. And I think it's, for me, was very surprising that su such a possibility exists. Uh, and um, also in your cases, there was certain, you know, certain sounds that acquired through experience in the case of the piano tuners that like were surprisingly um, uh, consistent um, across this group as were not for other people. So I was wondering if you can speculate, um, co like considering all the evidence um, we heard today and also your work, what is the cause or what is the possible causes that would generate one or the other effects, or co either consistency or inconsistencies. What, what is there that would make it happen like that? I can speculate, well, you know, I really think the colonial context is in 